So what I want to talk to you about today is about the impact that deep learning is, is having on IoT devices of all shapes and sizes. So uh, Feng gave a wonderful introduction to this area. And as you can see in this slide here, at the bottom portion, we see the diversity of IoT and mobile embedded devices that exist today, ranging from smartwatches, devices you wear on your head, um, though, or ranging to those that you have in the house, and so forth. And then, of course, it spans a wide application area, ranging from, from mobile health, digital assistance, uh, quantified enterprise type of scenarios, and, and urban sensing, and so forth. And, and the point of the slide is to say there's a huge diversity of the applications and ecosystems that are being built, but there is one. There is one unifying characteristic that binds them all together, and that is the need to process sensor data, typically using machine learning techniques. And that's what this slide is showing you here. So we have a generic set of components here. We have the sensors, the computation, the resources that all exist inside these IoT devices. At the top here, we have various types of sensors, accelerometers, audio, imaging um, devices. And what binds all these applications together is the need to transfer and understand these complex inputs into actionable pieces of information. Things like, am I stepping? Am I walking? Who's in the room? What are they saying? And so forth. And so, so what the point here is it doesn't matter to, to a degree to the research of what these applications are. What we need to do and what the subject of this talk is about is the need to run these machine learning algorithms on these devices directly under the constraints that they face. So um, many of the machine learning techniques out there, right now deep learning is of course the, sort of the technique du jour, um, have huge resource implications even at inference time. So even after the model's been trained, you're going to face high penalties in terms of, ac in terms of me uh, memory, energy, and, and compute. And fitting these things onto these devices is a huge uh, challenge. Uh, one that uh, we've been exploring now for about sort of four or five years. I remember the first time that I wrote a small paper about this topic was that I was actually in Fang's group back in the late uh, 2014. We wrote a tiny workshop paper about the, the difficulties and the needs to run deep learning on mobile devices. And then um, subsequently when I was working with um, Fahim and Akhil and other folks in the audience at Bell Labs, we wrote many papers on, on methods that, uh, that allow this sort of breakthroughs to occur. And um, if you want to think about the aims, the aims of this area are really stated here on the slide. It's all about overcoming this huge divide that exists today between uh, the mobile system constraints and embedded system constraints that exist, so mem memory in the kilobytes, energies in, in the watts, and so forth, and the, and the, and the constraints and the, the challenges that the huge machine learning models that we want to run on these devices uh, bring to bear. Um, the way I see it, uh, it really is going to be an interesting new frontier of machine learning, where if you see at the bottom of the slide here, I'm talking about accuracy and robustness being sort of the real um, goal that we need to overcome to deploy these applications, how accurate is the model going to be, and so forth. It's now being joined by a second goal um, that I'm going to highlight here, where we need to, for, for a model to have impact, it's not only about how good is the model, how accurate it is, but it's where can you run it. Uh, can you, we need to be able to run these things anywhere um, on any device, so that we have the toughest sensory understanding um, challenges that we have, those that exist in the home, in the car, in the office, those real complex environments, we need to have the best models that we have ever developed running on those devices. Um, now just to materialize a, a bit, what are the re and enumerate, what are the reasons why, like I'm sure many of you can think of very valid reasons why we want to have these uh, machine learning models running directly on the device versus running them in the cloud. Uh, one of the central elements of this is user privacy. That's one I've highlighted here. So of course, Fang gave this really uh, very powerful example at the end of his talk with, uh, I think, probably Alexa overhearing uh, a person's sort of very private conversations in the home. And because not all the models can run on the device, the, the only solution, the way to uh, realize that system is to push it to the cloud, run those models there, and then have the result pushed back. But as a side effect, you know, the, the company is at the, at the um, at the mercy of, of governments and other types of institutions that may ask them for that data. And they may, even, even if the company wants to protect the user as much as they can, there's going to be times where they might have to give it up. Uh, and so we can get rid of all of that. We can get rid of that whole problem. It's a huge, massive political and, and policy-driven problem, completely cut off at the knees if we can run everything on the device. Uh, there's other reasons why you want to do this too. Um, 
right now, if you have to have some models in the cloud and you have to have some simple models on, in the, on the uh, device itself, um, you have to maintain multiple different types of models that have different types of accuracies, different types of designs, and so forth. So it's a huge uh, burden to maintaining these systems. Um, Real-time execution. You can't have systems that people really need to re rely on if it's going to go to the cloud because what happens when connectivity is not there? Our users, you want to build things that users rely on. And if they're going to rely on these things, whenever the cloud's not there, they're not going to be able to deliver on the, on the you know, functionality of the device. So we need to have some way of executing the compute locally. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons. Now, those were all sort of fairly solid reasons about sort of from a very sort of application user-driven point of view, but it's very mobile and embedded only. Um, there's also a fundamental issue that really underpins a lot of this sort of uh, exploration of efficiency within the space of machine learning. And that's because unless we start to think seriously about how we're going to deliver on machine learning efficiently, we're not going to be able to keep on progressing uh, our rate of advancement of these models. What this slide is showing you is on the y-axis, uh, the amount of operations it takes to train a ver wide variety of, of machine learning techniques and models that have been invented over the last five years. Along the x-axis, we have years. And you'll see there's a pretty decent sample size, right? So from 2012 all the way up to present day. And the red dots there are a variety of different high-end machine learning models doing all sorts of different tasks. So you see at the top, at the top um, uh, left, we have AlphaGo um, Zero. So these are sort of these reinforcement learning techniques developed by DeepMind uh, to play a variety of games. So that's plotted on the same place as you might see um, VGG. So that's a very famous object recognition model that for in around the 2015 period was state of the art delivered by Oxford and state of the art in terms of object recognition. And it traces all the way back down to AlexNet. So one of the really pri pioneering efforts of deep learning that started to beat um, conventional um, models for the very first time back in 2012. They're all plotted here. So you, you can see that the compute demands of all these variety of techniques are actually doubling every three months. Just think about that. So if you contrast it to other sort of rules of thumb that we know about, say Moore's Law, we're talking about 18 months, right? So this is another reason why if we don't start taking efficiency in machine learning seriously, we're not only going to not be able to build these small devices, we're not even going to be able to start to improve at the rate that we've previously been seeing in the past in terms of, of advancing machine learning in general. And that's why this area is so important. So let me tell you about how far we've come. I mentioned that I've been doing this now for five years. A variety of other people have been too. So this is a, is a really strong illustration of an application that's built today that runs completely locally. You can download it right now on your smartphone. It's called Seeing AI. And there's a variety of these applications that I could have picked. This happens to be built from, by Microsoft. Uh, this illustration is of um, the application here. We're at the bottom here. That it's hosting a, a, a wide variety of state-of-the-art vision models. The use case is for people with vision impairment who want to be able to sort of have additional pieces of context about what they're seeing. And then the beauty of it is that they can put, for example, a dollar bill in front of their phone, and then it quickly uh, can tell them this is a dollar bill or this is a hundred dollar bill and so forth. It can even do what's called scene understanding. So you can sort of show somebody, uh, they, can, they can point it at a scene, uh, they press the button, it works over a couple of seconds, and then it tells them what they're seeing. So for example, this is a canned result, but it's indicative of what you'd see. So uh, there's a woman uh, in this image, and the, and the application says, 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. And if I had the time, I'd show you, you know, YouTube clips and so forth about people uh, using this um, application you know, worldwide uh, to sort of help them see and understand. And, the, and the, the, the key takeaway here is that because of the breakthroughs that have been made in the last sort of four years, this thing can run actually with all these models on the device using smartphone level uh, resources. Now, now, I grant you that smartphone res level resources are actually pretty powerful, but still, this type of application would have been literally impossible to build only four years ago. Um, so the variety of techniques that have been sort of the first generation of techniques that came out that enable us to put machine learning uh, of this type on this application has really come to bear, and we can now start seeing them coming down the pipe. Um, I know this is a general audience, so I want to give you just a, a small insight about what's really going on here. Uh, the bulk of what I'm talking about today are deep learning based models. Um, so let me tell you about one of the most intuitive methods that people have invented um, to start to reduce the complexity and allow them to run on the device. It's called, a, it's called node pruning, and the idea is very simple. Um, what you're going to do is take a, a model, that's the one shown on the left hand side, says before pruning, 
and you're going to make selective choices about removing the uh, connectivity between nodes. So as many of you would know, a deep learning model, at least in a fully connected scenario, is a series of nodes that are going to be, um, have the input layer or take the data at the, at the front end. They're then going to process over a series of layers of doing nonlinear transformations as it moves towards the end of the model, shown at the bottom there, towards the classification result. And this technique is just saying, let's be selective about how we're going to prune those, mo uh, those connected connections and even nodes back. And while we're going to trade off accuracy for the complexity of the model. And by making fairly simple heuristics about which, uh, which weights or which connections to prune, uh, you can do a pretty decent job. So, and so in fact, um, the, the, one of the key um, elements of this is that many of the weights are actually very small. And when, they have, when the weights are small, they have a low impact on the actual overall accuracy. And so then you can sort of relatively safely, I put safety in, in air quotes, you can start to prune them back and maintain accuracies that are very high. And, um, and this is one of the very simple kind of techniques that have been developed. There's dozens of techniques and dozens more in terms of variants of those techniques that have come down the pipe, but that, but that is underpinning what we see in seeing AI and a variety of other things you'd see from the likes of Google, Facebook, Snap, uh, Samsung, and so forth. Okay. And that's sort of illustrated here. Where we're, this is essentially saying wherever we've come on the left-hand side, I'm sort of egregiously sort of highlighting methods that we've developed over the last five years. And on the right-hand side, I'm, I'm showing other techniques that have been uh, developed too. Some really breakthrough ones. Many of you must have heard of SqueezeNet, which demonstrated, for example, um, AlexNet-style ac um, architectures on ImageNet with 50x reductions in size. Right. Um, let me highlight one method that we came up with um, in the last five years. It was pretty interesting. I've talked a lot about smartphones. So let me talk, you, talk to you about microprocessors. So you know, microprocessors, microcontrollers, things like the ARM0, ARM3, that's also an important piece of the ecosystem sort of uh, spectrum. Um, and so, so Fahim, Akhil, myself, back when we were working together, uh, we came up with an interesting set of techniques that enabled, at this time, a, a Google um, speaker ID model. So same architecture. Um, slightly compressed, we're giving up around 2 to 4% accuracy. This was back in early 2016, and we think that this is probably the very first example of running, quote unquote, full scale deep learning of a sort of a smartphone grade quality on, on a microcontroller. This is the ARM M0, M3. You'll note here, illustrated as, you know, 32 kilobytes. Crazy, crazy small. And I'm really happy to see in the last few years, um, ARM's built an incredible machine learning team that is starting to even push this thing even further. Um, what you'll note here is that these are fairly preliminary results because this figure here is showing you latency and energy and um, the type of sort of spread of, of you know, how much acceleration can we um, develop. Uh, it's a long way, right? So this is log scale. We're moving you know, many orders of magnitude. Um, but you'll see that it actually still takes a minute in this case for the speaker ID model to, to get a result. So really this is proof of concept. It's saying that you can run it on these devices. And back in 2016, we had a long way to go. So this is sort of where the community has been sort of coming from for the last sort of five years. Um, so now I want to sort of introduce an important point, which is where are we going to go in the next five years? Uh, in my view, there's sort of a real obsession with what I'd call model compression. So that's about making models smaller, squeezing them uh, in a variety of different shapes and sizes. And that largely comes on the back of a very simple property of machine learning training for these deep models right now that ends up pumping out over-parameterized models that are very um, easy to prune back in some respects. So what people have found is there's a variety of ways to go about it, but you can actually reduce model, model sizes by huge amounts, and this is what this figure is showing you, um, for small amounts of accuracy. So you can do that, to, but the question is, um, these techniques have been brilliant for showing us ways of you know, getting rid of the first 50x in terms of efficiency and allowing us to run them on, the, on phones and microcontrollers to some degree and so forth. But, but where are we going to get the next 50x gains and so forth? As I showed you on this illustration early on, it's not like machine learning models are standing still. Every month, every year, they want and demand more and more resources. So I really want to highlight that we have to think carefully. There's only so far that compressing these models, going from sort of 16-bit to 8-bit, or breaking the, um, breaking the sort of the matrix factorizations of these models down smaller and smaller can take us. So we really have to start thinking about um, these methods, I think, that, that many of us in the community now know and love and that have powered us a long way so far as actually first-generation methods that are not going to cut it for the next five years. 
So you they're more like Betamax or CDs versus uh, MP3 players in terms of methods. And so for this community, um, I wanted to highlight two interesting areas of, of, of exploration. We've done a little bit of in initial work that I think can start to help bridge this sort of in, uh, gap and find this next 50x gains that we're going to need to keep on progressing further. Um, I want to highlight that in terms of the teams I have in Oxford and Samsung, we take sort of more of a full stack approach with this variety of, of, of um, of investment in terms of looking at the algorithms and the trainings and the, the architectures themselves. Um, but what I want to highlight here is two areas I think that this community is acutely positioned to uh, really push forward. And that is in two fronts. One, um, automated specialization of these models towards different types of hardware. And two, that the desperate need that we have today to be able to effectively share memory and compute across different models or with other types of processes on the devices today that is a, that is, that's a facility that is incredibly unsupported and that we need to start to think about how we're going to offer this moving forward. So let me talk about this first one here, uh, automated specialization. What this really speaks to is the fact that when you look at different platforms, uh, there's a variety of compute models and memory models. And then if you don't think about how are you going to map your, it's, it's, it's an old story, right? If you don't think about how you're going to map your, your compute and your uh, usage of these resources tightly to these devices, you're going to have yo low utilizations. So we have a variety of other methods for sort of arbitrary programs out there, compilers and so forth. But for the specific specialized types of compute where the data flows are very specific, the types of operations are highly specialized, there's huge opportunities for doing um, uh, automated specialization in terms of how much acceleration you can get. And, and the name of the game really is about being able to do this in an automated fashion. Because if you can automate this, you can, um, you can start to do this on a per device basis, a per model basis, a per database basis. So let me just quickly show you sort of uh, the closest method you could think of right now is things like AutoML um, that are doing fantastic jobs, but they don't really articulate fully the, the variety of design space choices you're going to have to really think about when you customize your model for a particular type of hardware. So let me just show you, for example, something that the automated techniques that exist today are unable to support. This is a, a, um, a type of partitioning that we came up with back in 2016 in a semi-hand-built fashion. We're essentially we're injecting different types of matrix factorization, partitioning it over the GPU, the CPU, and the, um, an MPU on a, on a mobile um, NVIDIA Tegra to show that you can do in real time things like vision. This was back in 2016. But my point here is that there is no method for doing automated specialization today that could discover that type of partitioning. And that's the gap that exists today. So we can do things like we can reduce the number of layers. We can shape the uh, different layers inside there. We can have some indirect um, impact on how it's going to use memory and so forth. But what we really need to do is move to a space where we have automated tools that allow us to specialize in an offline fashion for the devices. There's huge things to be said for being able to articulate the, uh, the specific types of um, designs of the SOC. What are the processing units? How are they connected? What's the bandwidth within those units? And what's the, what's the workload you're going to face? And then doing it in an automated fashion. And again, where I think the key is that you, if for the automated tool, you can do it per model, per task, per device that can show huge gains. I can show you one uh, very sort of preliminary result um, that gives you a sense of where you can go with this. This is uh, an automated, uh, just for GPU only, just for audio only. So it doesn't even do half of what I'm sort of saying we need to do. But you can see highlighted here on the, on the right-hand side of the figure is a, is a 21x uh, automated gain. So automated method that will show you 21x gains um, against the CPU in this case for running an automated, uh, running a, um, an audio training technique. Uh, I just want to also talk about the sort of second front that I think we could really explore. Um, and to do that, I want to illustrate the redundancy that exists in so many models today. Here are three different models. There are, there are two different layers. I've, I've hidden the, the later layers and just showing the earlier ones. So those that are sort of more familiar with deep learning and so forth will know that these earlier um, transformations are really looking for things like edges and so forth. Um, but would anyone, th these, these are three different models all doing three different tasks. But given the information I'm showing of the earlier layers, would anyone want to hazard a guess as to what tasks these models are actually performing? Anyone want to guess at what these three different models are actually trying to do? Maybe I kill. Can you want to, do you want to guess? So that's the first time I've done this slide where someone actually got one of them right. So uh, 
the later layer, well done, Kakil. So the later, the later layers, as you expose, you start to understand what the tasks are doing. The point of the slide, even though Akil got the first one right, which is excellent, the other two are doing cars and elephants, but the point of the slide is saying that when you train these models, the early layers all do similar things. Why? It's obvious, right? Because there's so much of vision is a, a generic task. Understanding layer, understanding edges, understanding colors, all these things are necessary building blocks towards being able to say what a face is and so on. The point here is that just imagine a system that has no idea about these opportunities for, for um, optimization and sharing of, of um, the model. Um, just think about how you do scheduling if you had no idea that these different layers can be shared. Uh, this, this is just a toy example of the huge amounts of, of, of potential for systems that understand that the scheduling in, this, in the memory uh, layers in particular, how you can start to, to do these variety of, of resource sharing techniques that are completely missing today. From, from many of the, the systems that are being used. I'm sure they're being developed, but this, they're, they're missing largely from the ones we use in production. Um, and so this slide speaks to the sort of things that we can do um, where the ambition is to develop a series of schedulers, uh, uh, devices able to do memory layout and context switching. You can imagine microkernels sitting right above, above an MPU that is really smart about how it's going to page in and out the next model you mean, you're trying to run because it has full awareness of what it was doing in the prior sort of model. Um, if we can realize these ambitions, we can start to realize gains of, of, of these. And this is just a, a toy, uh, is arguably still a fairly toy result, um, where we're doing, uh, we're showing the ability of sharing different layers for an audio modeling task. The, the slide is illustrating how for five different tasks we can do this without losing much accuracy and where the gains are three, four, five X. Um, now this doesn't work for all tasks. It is not a purely automated method in terms of how it does the sharing yet. But again, this is illustrative of the opportunities that exist there right now. So um, I have to wrap up, but I'm gonna wrap up just briefly with a, just a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, where are we going to go? So imagine if we can do this thing, we can get our next 50x, what's next for these devices? And I want to highlight that um, this is going to give us the chance to finally start to building uh, mobile devices and, and embedded devices that can go beyond just classification. What we can do today is classification, as we see on this smartphone app I showed you. Um, but imagine a future where we're not just doing sort of discriminative tasks, recognizing steps and so forth with other devices, but imagining uh, the ability to have a full cognitive stack on a, on a device like a Fitbit, where you're doing not only perception, but you're doing understanding. There's a level of, of common sense and reasoning. If we can manage to have all those things squeezed onto the device, we can start to build devices that do the things that we're really passionate about having them do. So when, I, when I'm going up the stairs and my heart rate increases, it knows that I'm not having a heart attack because it knows the broader context of my health. When I'm driving, it knows not to, not to ring. These are, in some sense, these are sort of the holy grail of, of application scenarios we've wanted for a long time that are going to be possible if we start to have these methods become efficient. And my final comment before I get pulled off the stage is that there's a lot of angst in the community about, oh, um, adopting machine learning techniques and, and so forth. But this is an area where systems and mobile systems can really start to improve and help and push forward machine learning in general. And I say that because just think once we start to develop the methods that allow machine learning to be efficient, we can actually start to have a positive impact in just how machine learning progresses in the future. Um, by making things more efficient, we can allow them or us to explore different architectures much quicker. Right now, a, an architecture might take two weeks. Imagine what a scientist can do if it only takes two days. We can allow these models to train on larger amounts of data. We're going to allow um, new tasks to be possible, or even new te techniques to be feasible. Um, and to illustrate that, here's a model that we came up with uh, a couple of years ago where it has the same representational power necessary to support tasks like ImageNet, but a huge order of magnitude lower amounts of um, parameters to be trained. And that's where research in this area can go um, and how it can also impact not only our own area, but other areas around us. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take uh, questions. <laughs>